In just a few moments, the lights are going to dim, and we are going to screen a new documentary by James Redford called Paper Tigers. The cameras follow six troubled students at Lincoln Alternative High in Walla Walla, Washington. This documentary focuses on six students over the course of the 2012 and 2013 school year. We are witness to the ups and downs of their lives, of domestic abuse, learning disabilities, and homelessness, just to name a few. Through the personal diary cameras and interviews with school's officials, we begin to see how things transform. In every school in America, walking down every street in America, there are the kids that get labeled, get rid of them. They're nothing but trouble. Lincoln sits right in the heart of the most assaults, gang activity, truancy. I did hear that it was the worst school you could ever go to. Kids had knives, the fights, absolute chaos. He pissed me off and I threw a chair at him. And I told him I was going to kill him. All of them were messed up. I was invited to go to a conference about complex trauma and what stress does to the brain. Kid. The behavior is a symptom of what's going on in their life. My mom was like, get your shit and leave. She's the only thing I had. And for her to abandon me like that. His coping mechanism was drinking a ton, smoking a ton. I remember one night, I just, I didn't want to be alive. It hit me, and it hit me really hard. You have to unconditionally love them and you have to believe that their behavior might be out of their control. I love playing guitar with several of these guys. I feel like that's almost as strong as anything we ever do in class. After that, he wasn't only a disciplined figure, he was like a friend. Half of the student body had over a 3-point GPA. watch their confidence come back has been incredible. I'm not by myself anymore, I got a team. If I can do it, all of you can definitely do it. It's not that I'm judging you. I know why you're smoking me, I know why you smoke meth. I know why your fights you don't wanna feel. I mean, that's the big challenge is I'm asking you to try feeling for a little bit because sometimes when you feel, it guides you in the direction that you should be going and not to where you are. Good evening, uh, bienvenidos. My name is Mary Lou Fulton. I'm a senior program manager here at the California Endowment. It's my pleasure to be the moderator for this evening's discussion. And I don't know about you, but I feel like the announcement for this movie should have included a notice that we all needed to bring some Kleenex. <laughs> um, it was a, a beautiful movie. And um, I feel the situations that we saw were difficult and complicated, but the answer is simple. The answer is love. And i um, so glad we could share um, this story tonight and that we have a chance to talk with our panel and to talk with all of you about your impressions of the film. Um, I know we have educators in the room as well um, and about uh, how we can work together to really build this movement uh, for more of this type of approach in more of our schools so that more of our young people can succeed. So we're fortunate tonight to have uh, James Redford, the director and producer of Paper Tigers with us here on the panel. Um, we also have Wendy Nichols Julian, who's um, from the California Conference on Equality and Justice talking with us uh, tonight about restorative practices in California schools, a growing movement um, that we certainly support greatly here at the California Endowment. And also, uh, <laughs> Abraham Medina, project director of the Santana Boys and Men of Color, part of our Building Healthy Communities work here at the California Endowment. Um, We're going to spend about 15 minutes just sharing some of our thoughts up here, and then we're going to open it up for questions and conversation. And I'm going to start with Jamie and ask you to share with us 
Um, you know, what motivated you to create this film and what do you hope will come of it? Well, I, um, uh, I made this film with Karen Fritzker. Uh, we did a film about dyslexia three, about three years ago and we're looking at what we wanted to do next. And she sent me the Robert Anda and Vincent Fuliti study about ACEs. And, you know, the first time, I'm sure a lot of people in this room are familiar with that study. If you're not, you should check it out. Um, but it, it, it's a mind blower the first time you encounter this very solid research that links uh, poor health outcomes to difficult, un, sort of, uh, uh, sort of unmitigated childhood stress. Uh, and it was such a vast uh, topic that we really couldn't figure out how to tackle it. The, ver the first thing I tried to do was sort of make a movie about ACEs, and it, it, it's, it wasn't good. <laughs> and I had been in Lincoln, and we decided, you know what, let's just let it, let's just go to Lincoln and, and, and let that school Let's just, we know that they're getting remarkable resort, results. Let's just go there and park our butts and let Lincoln tell the story. And then halfway through that story, I realized, well, really, let the kids tell the story. So I invited them to become storytellers with me. And, and what you see is what Lincoln is. And I think the hope is uh, there's so many dimensions around how we need to rethink childhood trauma and all the ramifications and all the threads that go through it, but the, the common factor is really checking some of our assumptions of, about uh, what we see on the surface of behavior um, with young kids, teenagers. And I'm just hoping that this film can do what it did for me, frankly, which is that I, we all know that part of town where you drive by and there's a group of kids hanging out and you think, ooh, wow, hope my kid's not hanging out there, right? selfish, sort of superficial, like, you know, I don't look at any, any situation like that the same anymore after having made this movie. And in fact, I came up San Pedro from the airport to get here tonight, and you drive down San Pedro, and maybe two years ago I would have been struck by how rough it looked there, but to me it just completely affects me in a different way as a, as a result of me making this movie, so I'm hoping that the people that just see the film, it can maybe shift their hearts a little bit. And of course, we hope people use it as a tool. Great. Thank you, Jamie. Um, before I turn it over to Wendy and Abraham, I wanted to just um, bring this issue home to California a little bit and just share with you some of what we know from the research about the presence of adversity and trauma uh, here in California. So. Uh, bringing up a couple of slides here, but it's really, um, it's, it's everywhere. It's more common than anyone uh, likes to think. And in California, we know that 18% of children have two or more adverse childhood experiences or incidents of trauma in LA County, that number is 20%. Uh, we know that children who are vulnerable, who live in economic hardship, are, more, are also more vulnerable to trauma and adversity. We know um, that the data reflects really what we heard in the movie about uh, one of the most common types of adversity being family separation of a loss of a parent to illness, to incarceration, to just um, the difficulties that lead to families to break up and the impact that has on kids, the impact of poverty, growing up around substance abuse, and witnessing violence or being the victim of violence in your home and community. Move to the next slide. Um, and we also are learning more about the impact on learning. It's really common sense when you think about it that children who go through these experiences at home are not able to just leave them um, at the gate of school. They come with them, they affect their ability to focus and learn, and we see that children who have exposure to trauma are more likely to repeat a grade. They're twice as likely to have he chronic health problems that affect their attendance, their ability to, to be in school every day. We know it's the number one predictor of school suspension uh, from research in Washington State and the number two predictor of academic failure after being in special education. And here in California, 
uh, at the endowment. We're certainly big believers and supporters in restorative practice and restorative justice as an alternative to harsh school discipline, to suspending and expelling and removing kids from school, from the environment that they need most uh, to learn and thrive and, and have a bright future. So I'm going to ask Wendy to speak for a few moments about the work that she's helping to lead in California. Thank you, and thank you very much for having me here. And it's nice to see some old friends and new friends in the audience, and, uh, and I'm pleased that you've come to hear this story. I just want to say thank you, Jamie, for making this film, and to the California Endowment for funding the efforts that are happening um, here in Los Angeles County and throughout California. Uh, I work for a nonprofit called the California Conference for Equality and Justice, CCEJ, and our mission is to eliminate bias, bigotry, and racism through education, conflict resolution, and advocacy. So um, you might wonder how we got involved in trauma-informed practices and restorative practices, and a part of the reason for that is that um, there are some really serious systemic oppression issues related to harsh school discipline policies. Uh, there are some of them are reflected in the in the film. Uh, the statistics show that students with disabilities are twice as likely to be suspended. African American students three and a half times as likely to be suspended as white students. Uh, these are issues that require dismantling, and that's what restorative practices are. Restorative practices are a complete change in the culture of schools and organizations. Uh, I, I heard the principal say in the film, uh, there's not a curriculum, and I, I agree with that. It really is a change in the way of thinking. It's a change in the way of acting, uh, and a change in the way of responding in particular. It's a slowing down of the process. It can even be painfully slow sometimes for somebody like me who likes to get things done. Uh, but it's a, a caring and loving opportunity to really accept people and meet them where they're at and find a way to make this the kind of world that I want to live in uh, where, uh, where people are respected and treated equally. So that's how it fits into our mission. Uh, the way that our work looks in California, we have uh, schools where uh, they have adopted whole school restorative approaches, like the one that you saw in the film. Uh, we also have schools where some really awesome teachers, administrative uh, administrators and counselors have learned themselves and are implementing these practices in their own classrooms. Uh, and then there are some places where the students are taking the initiative and uh, pushing for and advocating for changes in policy to uh, move away from, in particular, punitive discipline around things like um, behavior in the classroom that doesn't meet the standards of the educational code type disciplines. So uh, just to give you an example of how that happens, uh, we have a pilot program funded by the endowment and it's not really even a pilot anymore. It's been going for three years now at Reed Continuation School, which is a Long Beach Unified School in West Long Beach. Uh, it actually has a lot of similarities to the school in the film. Uh, through that school, uh, we met a young woman who um, had been kicked out of the, pushed out of the traditional school uh, for truancy and other, other issues. So she came to the continuation school where there was a restorative justice approach and within about a week was in a conflict again with a, uh, another young woman on campus. So um, before it went to blows or anything that had to happen, uh, they were referred to the restorative justice coordinator uh, who was Rob Howard, my colleague, who some of you may know. Um, and uh, Rob did an intervention, a circle with them, and it was a practice that a lot of the students were familiar with because he liked to do fun community building circles all the time. And so this, this young woman came in and she sat through the process and she participated and they avoided the fight. Uh, so there wasn't a need for the suspension and they were able to uh, restore a relationship between the two young women. Uh, she went on to get trained as a restorative justice practitioner and uh, eventually has been now working in the field of restorative justice, which is pretty incredible. So um, this is something that I've seen with my own eyes work. Uh, we were talking at the end of the 2014 school year about how things were going at that school, and we were looking back at some of the statistics. And I asked Rob, you know, what had what had happened as far as the fights on campus and whether there had been a reduction. And he said, well, in the most recent numbers I was looking at, the, there were no fights involving girls on campus. And I said, oh, wow, you mean like in, in May? <laughs> and he said, no, no. There were no fights involving girls on campus all year long. Uh, that's incredible. Uh, it's incredible, and what it means is that our young people are being able to focus on school, 
graduate, go to college, and feel like they have a place where they can be respected and belong uh, in this beautiful room. So just one other quick story of what happened in that room. He, uh, Rob Facebooked a picture one time of himself with his boots up on the table, on the desk, like he was doing nothing. That was his picture during the middle of work. And, uh, and he said, look in the background. And so the youth at this school um, had never had a yearbook uh, because they didn't get to celebrate their time at school. They were in the continuation school. And the, they had come in, and he'd allowed them to use a restorative justice room for uh, creating the yearbook. And they'd gotten into a little bit of an argument about who was going to do what. And so one of them said, all right, we can't do this. We need a circle. So they got themselves into a circle. Uh, one of them selected a talking piece. And they, um, they monitored their conflict, and they resolved their conflict in a circle by themselves while Rob was sitting at the desk with his feet on the desk. So um, these practices are, uh, they're successful and they're useful and I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to implement them. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Abraham, can you share with us the work that you're helping to lead in Santana and the impact you've seen? Yeah, definitely. Um, again, my name is Abraham Medina. I was really impacted by, by, by the video because I'm doing the work that we do I feel it's something that's been ongoing in our communities for some time. Um, at the age of seven, I, I came here undocumented with my mom, um, um, escaping domestic violence. And me and my brother, um, we crossed on our own. And my mom met us up after. Um, we spent two weeks in a place uh, where we couldn't go out. And uh, I remember just experiencing uh, a lot of feelings and a lot of things being in, uh, inside a room for two weeks. Um, it wasn't until I graduated from, uh, from university I asked my mom how long I had been in there because it had, to me, it had felt like a month. And she said I was there for two weeks. But um, I definitely remember um, in the middle of the night hearing her voice. And they had to lock the door because I wanted to come outside and look for her or, get out, or try to walk out the door. And so these houses, they, you know, they're safe houses, you know, um, keep you inside. But I feel like that pattern is really impactful, in the way that once you're here, how does that manifest in school and behavior? How do people react to you, to your anger? Most of my poetry growing up was about violence and death. And so right now, part of the, not only do we do work through restorative practices, but we on Saturdays we have uh, in Santana through Santana Boys and Men of Color we have something called the uh, Youth for Transformation Institute, and through that has been been um, trying to implement what I've learned. Uh, I think I was I went to a camp that allowed me to go through experience some of that transformation myself, some of those healings, some of that healing. Uh, we were training Hovind Noble, so we're trying to address the trauma in our, in our lives through culturally informed practices, through restorative practices, because the goal is to transform cycles of violence into cycles of love. And so for me, to, to us, that, that's very important because by the time we're 12 years old, we've, we've experienced 12 years of violence. And so it's not, it's not overnight that we're going to be like, oh, think five positive thoughts. It doesn't happen that way. <laughs> you know, it takes time. It might take a year. It might take two years. And sometimes, like, that going back and forth is difficult. So I think uh, to us that we're trying to implement curriculum that, that helps us generate those transformative spaces. Because the goal is not only to transform ourselves, because in the process of transforming ourselves, we transform each other. And the aim is to transform our communities. And on the bigger picture, we want to impact and reduce the school to prison deportation pipeline. Um, and I think that was very important because to us in, in Santana, our work in, around policy is seeing how suspensions lead to expulsions, lead to uh, uh, you know, some continuation schools, lead to maybe juvenile hall, and if you're undocumented, it leads to deportations. And so to us, it was very important to address not only the system, but create resilience and transformation within ourselves. That health happens here means that transformation happens here, that resilience happens here, and that together it's about interconnectedness. 
It's about generating that interconnectedness well, that will sustain that, that transformation in the long term because it's about building sisterhood, brotherhood, diohood, diahood, elderhood. We need everybody. That, that interconnectedness is what is going to sustain that transformation. Thank you so much. We're going to open it up for Q&A, and uh, some folks are around the sides with microphones so that we can uh, hear you. And I wanted to ask Abraham to maybe get us started with our youth leaders from Zanzana who are here uh, with him to share um, some questions or reflections on the film and the conversation tonight. Yeah, definitely. I just want to, if, if a group from Santana could please stand and give a round of applause to all the youth that came out today. All right. With us. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Well, I wanted, I wanted to ask uh, David. He's 17 years old. He just graduated from a continuation school in Santana called Lauren Grisset. So um, I just wanted to ask him, uh, how, how did the movie or the documentary relate to you? Or how are you impacted by it? <laughs> <laughs> well, my name is um, David Salagong. I'm 17 years old, and I'm from Santa Ana, Boys and Men of Color. This video impacted me a lot. Like, I felt sad seeing it. Like, I have a sister, and hearing that that girl's and got molested, and started bringing me thoughts to my head. Of like, I kind of have a good bond with my sister, so I don't know what she's been through or not. So, basically, yeah, and then I connected with one of the kids, um, Aaron. Like, at first he looked like he doesn't, he didn't care. That's how I felt. I was in sixth, sixth grade. One of my teachers told me because I didn't care. They told me that I was going to end up either dead or in jail. So I was like, I cussed them on. I was like, fuck it. I don't care. And when I graduated, I went back to talk to him. And when I was there sitting down next to him face to face, I was about like, I wanted to cuss him out again too. But he told me, he's, he's like, I told you that so you could come back with your diploma and show it to my face. And I was like, and he's like, I, I didn't mean it. I just wanted you to do better. And well, kind of cried right there, but like I gave him a hug and he's like, you know, you, you're, better, you're a better man now, you know? It's like, this video was, Touching and you know, like I don't know what to say. <laughs> Thank you, David. How about over here on the left? The movie was very moving, and uh, I like the touch in the beginning with the deer, uh, <laughs> kind of reflective of uh, the kind of wildlife that some of the people have had. Um, it's so easy to see a wonderful movie like this and then kind of go back to our own lifestyles and move on with the day-to-day -day sorts of things. Um, and I was just wondering how much uh, political activity could be done, and I know that takes a long, long time. But with that being said, it would be wonderful for the folks that did go through the program, if there was some way for them to be a spokesperson and reach out to uh, some of the other communities as well as educate the um, politicians as well as other family members and other students or youngsters that are in the same boat. I wonder if that had been given any thought and what was the possibility or reaction you had. Yes, um, the, the first, well, first of all, uh, this is one of two movies that Karen and I have made in this world of adverse childhood experiences. Uh, the second one is called Resilience. Um, 
and it will be completed late summer and ready for distribution in the early part of 2016. And that film really takes a hard look at the specifics around what these adverse childhood experiences do, um, how, what can we do to prevent them from impacting kids, what can we do to help reduce uh, the toxic load if, if it is occurring, and how do you bring people back once they've been exposed. It's, a, it's much more of a focused tool and has really been created so that, uh, you know, this is an emergent um, field. Uh, it's, it's not understood by the public yet. Uh, we want to help change that. And we feel our timing has been really fortunate with organizations like the California Endowment, Robert Wood Johnson, American Academy of Pediatrics, and others are really pushing forward. I think this issue of what trauma does to children is going to help reframe it in a way that the average person can just get it a little better, and maybe take it into their hearts a little bit more. So th those two movies are really made to help push that basic fact forward. In terms of what we're doing with the films, the first time we exposed the public to the film was at a, an event um, in San Francisco last fall with the Center for Youth Wellness. Um, are any of you familiar with Dr. Nadine Burke Harris? And she's a remarkable um, person and they hosted a conference there. We showed the trailer and we had 300 requests for the screening a week later show up on our little tiny website splash page. And in the intervening time, I think the thing that's most inspiring to me is we were expecting to have to force feed this film. And what we're finding is that there is a desire and a willingness to embrace the film and take it out there. So we're now completely overwhelmed with screening requests, which is a great problem. And we're, so we're, we're trying to figure out when do we do certain screenings. So the fall, we'll, we'll be doing screenings with part, high level screenings with partner organizations with a group called TUG that helps facilitate large screenings. I wish the California Endowment could do this every day of the week, but. <laughs> Clear my you know, schedule. <laughs> you know, but you know, we'll be having high profile screenings with real change makers like there are in this room all through the fall, then it will become available uh, through educational distribution, meaning you just buy a screening license and you can screen it in your locale any amount of times you want to 10 or 100 or 1,000 people. And then it goes to a television broadcast on the Pivot Channel in June of 2016. So along the way, we'll be doing what we can to support, and we really hope that anybody, anybody that wants to see the film or screen it, whether you got 10 people or 100, We'll help you do that. We'll find the right screening for what your needs are. Um, and as for people to travel around with the film, Jim Sporleader, you know, it's been two years since the kids graduated. And uh, lots been going on, some ups and downs, as, as you can imagine, but uh, largely positive for the kids. And Jim Sporleader is now um, head of something called the Children's Resiliency Initiative. No longer the principal at Lincoln High. He's taken that model into the Walla Walla, Walla public school systems at large and trying to make sure that all the schools there are practicing these ideas. He's on the road all the time. So are some of his colleagues uh, in that organization. Um, I've been talking a lot, the, the young woman, Kelsey, I mean, she's just awesome, is she not? And um, she really wants to, she wants to be a spokesperson. So we're gonna help her get out there. Um, she's doing remarkably well going to graduate early, go to college early. So you'll probably see her around a bit, hopefully. And I uh, just wanted to add for uh, us Californians that we do have um, a new school funding law in California called the Local Control Funding Formula. And it provides an opportunity to advocate for these types of approaches because it uh, recognizes that the learning environment, the student engagement, parent involvement, all of these things are as important as how well you do on tests to learning and achievement. And so in every school district, every one of you has an opportunity to participate and advocate for these types of approaches because there's new money and more money available for exactly that. So. I have a, I have a question. Yeah, um, go ahead. First of all, um, thank you for um, organizing this and bringing us together. Um, the director, thank you for your time and allowing this space to happen. Um, that movie, um, I cried. And there were, um, th every tear had a different poem when I saw different um, elements to the film. 
But my question is um, to the pharmaceutical industry. Um, have you, is there an idea to show it to them? Because oftentimes, um, a lot of, let's be real, um, sometimes a lot of these um, pharmaceuticals, they make, they're making billions of dollars out of our communities, out of our um, brothers and sisters, and instead of, of addressing the root causes, they're, they're just labeling people and saying so and so, and then, and so a lot, in, a lot of these individuals, they go, they go stigmatized in a way they say I have certain things when the actual issue it's farther than bipolar or ADHD or you know schizophrenic whatever when there's like deeper issues to tackle and so my question is um, do you plan on showing it to these pharmaceutical industries and having uh, a dialogue as a way to like you know like our communities have been you know they've been taken advantage of and this is another way that some of them have can basically, um, they can profit out of our, you know, wounded soldiers as an S-O-U-L. So, one of the amazing things that Dr. Nadine Burke Harris says in Resilience is she said, you know, I, uh, I went through medical school, became a doctor, and I was told how to do this, take the temperature, take the body weight, take the blood pressure, do the blood testing, you name it, I learned all that to be a good doctor. And never once did anybody mention to me that far more at risk to the wellness of my children than smoking and, other, and sugar and other things are these underlying experiences. There's far more, far more of a threat to their well-being. So, and, and she even makes the point of that how often she has to wrestle with the misdiagnosis of ADHD because the, uh, the behavioral symptoms of ADHD and a child that is in chronic fight or flight and are reactive from chronic exposure to stress, there are a lot of parallels there. But if you give um, Adderall to someone who's not ADHD but has had a, a, an A score of six or so, um, it makes it worse. Um, but this is going on all over the place. And that's, that's with all kinds of uh, medications. But I, if you ask me the core thing, because I don't, I think the pharmaceuticals are there to make money, and that's just it. They're, they're, and I, I would rather us put our emphasis on changing what it means to provide good health care for children. Because if you give a more holistic, um, uh, you know, they come in and they get an assessment that includes what's your life like as a very real factor in their health and well-being, then, then you, you can get in there and, and, and build some strength there before you're um, victimized by the pharmaceuticals. Thank you. Any questions on this side of the house? As we saw the caregivers and the teachers in this film suffering through compassion, stress, and fatigue and vicarious trauma, and I think as all of us who are caregivers here, whether we're nurses or doctors, physicians, teachers, um, we see this day in and day out. And for us to really hold that place of empathy and still care, but not pay the cost in compassion stress. So I'm wondering what you saw that school do to treat and prevent compassion stress and vicarious trauma for their Staff. Uh, Eric Gordon, the, the science teacher, you know, he was asked that question at, at the premiere in Seattle. I said, what do you do? And he said, I drink. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm not saying that, I'm not suggesting that, but I mean, it's, 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 it's kind of the truth in some ways, and at the same time, it's a problem. And, um, and I could make a whole other film, and in fact, a film has just recently been made that looks at the danger of caregiver stress. Um, you know, anybody that's been in a situation, in, in any context really, uh, when, you, when you are either the, the caregiver, or even if you're the cause of the stress, either way, you know, the impact you're having and, and that, what that stress is, is, is significant as any other form. And I, 
I've seen and talked to the teachers at Lincoln a lot about it. They all have their own unique ways. Eric, as, as connected to the kids as he is, in the summertime, he really shuts down. And he goes off and does other work. He actually, his idea of chilling out for the summer is fighting wildfires in the mountains outside of Walla Walla. So to each his own, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a completely different thing. Uh, and I think, you know, the teachers that seem to hang in, because, you know, the worst thing you want to do is have a great teacher who lasts three years and then becomes damaged or embittered or cynical. Um, that just makes things worse. The ones that I noticed uh, tend to be able to try to, they, they keep it in perspective, you know. And Jeannie, as she admits in the film, um, she's doing better now. She's figuring out her own balance, but it's hard. It's really, it's, you're asked, look, you're asking a lot. I mean, let's not pretend that it isn't hard to ask teachers to care more, you know. It's a huge ask. But the result is so good, you know. I, it is, it is uh, if, if I may, like, please. Um, it, is it is difficult because it is very draining, very intensive, um, you know. Uh, but I think that's why restorative practices and and, and whole wide school wide implementation is very important. And also, I appreciate uh, not not only the concept of of uh, restorative practices within practitioners, but also the technical support that's provided by, uh, say for example, um, the National Compilers Network when doing Hovenole, where they provide a space uh, once a month for circle keepers to, to go and have that space for, for, for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, that um, you know, taking in those energies, but being able to center ourselves and root ourselves again is very important because if not, well, like we might perpetuate those cycles of violence or, or, or lash out or, or out of stress. So I think uh, we're trying to develop that either by those protocols, by either by, by exercising or by attending um, circles or um, restorative uh, circles for practitioners or the uh, support provided by, by technical uh, assistance that, that we're able to work with. So. I think that that's very key because if not, like, yeah, the work itself, then it wouldn't be sustainable within it's, ourselves. It's a very important question, and we are starting to see emerging um, models such as school-wide meditation practices that involve teachers, school staff, and students in kind of learning how to recognize those signs of anger and anxiety and learn what to do to calm yourself and heal yourself. Um, and I don't know if Lynn Kaplan is still here in the room, right over there from the David Lynch Foundation, which has a program called Quiet Time um, that is used in some California schools. So if anybody here is an awesome. educator and interested in learning more, you can uh, see Lynn after uh, we're If you have, just here. have to say, there's a movie called Room to Breathe. Are you familiar with Room to Breathe, the documentary? Amazing. And that really does focus specifically on meditation in the classroom, if you're interested. Yeah. Awesome for Hi, um, I'm a teacher in LA Unified, and um, I just think it's um, amazing that this new band-aid of restorative justice is being put on, on um, being asked of schools. About six years ago, I transferred to a school, and every day my kids were getting into fights when they would come back from the yard, and I was overwhelmed. And I think in terms of, of the, which camp you're going to be on, if I'm going to deal and care more with children, the stress that comes from that, it's worse when you don't deal with and that what teachers are having to um, face every day when they don't deal with the, uh, the, the issues that the, they have in their classrooms. So um, I ran into Doreen Rivera at a party and she is the owner of Body Mind Institute. And for six years she came, um, well almost five years, came every day on, a, on every Thursday for, um, to implement and when you talk about there's no curriculum, we didn't really have a curriculum, but we started to work with the children. This is third grade children. And of course, my um, uh, suspension rates and sending to the office completely was eliminated because of the work that we were doing. And it just took the caring adults and what we did. But I want her to you know, really talk about the work. And because the other thing that I want to say before this, 
is that it wasn't just what we did with the children, it's what she did with me as the mm -hmm. teacher because I had to process also. I had to understand my emotional connection to what the children were experiencing myself, which I was blind to. And so this work really helped me become a better teacher. And at the same time, I'm really wanting to know how we can, we can expand the kind of work that um, someone like Doreen does so that it's not just one classroom and it's not just 20 kids at a time. So I don't know if you would like to add to. <laughs> anyway, um, so how do we expand it? You know, because we talk about, yeah, that emotional intelligence, but what do we do? Because this room is full of people who care. I bet we wouldn't be here if we didn't. And sometimes we feel like it's so big, the problem is so big, but just sometimes it would be three, four, and up to 10 people would come to my classroom on that Thursday for an hour. And the impact was just powerful, very, very powerful. And we just took it and it became very organic and we became very present for those children. So I'm just curious because we talked about the high school, but it needs to really start at the, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. kindergarten, these kids are coming in emotionally disturbed, kindergarten. Yeah, maybe Wendy, um, you've seen sort of how this movement gets started right. in a school. How does that start? I mean, I think I appreciate the fact that in the film, it doesn't call out any one particular practice by name. And I think I would agree that there's not a cookie cutter model. There's not one model that can work for every school, every culture. I mean, I think there were some people here from Augustus Hawkins High School uh, where they're doing a whole school implementation really based around restorative practices. And then there are other places where they're doing very trauma-informed care and don't call it restorative practices right. at all. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I think that what the, the paradigm shift is around focusing on what should the punishment be for breaking this rule and changing it to what was the harm and what, it, what it, everybody who was affected by the harm, what, are their, what do they need and what are their responsibilities for fixing it? So it's a, it's a shift in how we look at harms that are caused regardless of what name you put on it. Uh, but it does, it does require time and it does require a culture shift. There's no doubt about it. Can I just make one observation that Jim Sporleader said? I thought it was sort of interesting. Principal, you know, he, the, he, he, it's not like he spent his life with this point of view. He came on it in a state of desperation when he, was, when he became principal of, um, of Lincoln High School. It was called Payne Elementary before it was called Lincoln. <laughs> it's amazing. But he, he said, um, well, I don't know, you know, I mean, Jim in his way, like, you know, I was just mad at the kids all the time. I was you know, kicking them out of class, expelling them. I was just mad, mad, mad. So it's hard to care about them, but it's sort of better than being mad all the time. I thought that was kind of like, yeah, I guess so. You know. Any other uh, And I think questions? we have time for one last question. One last here. question. I'm really excited about this film because it deals with the work that we deal with. And what I thought was most important that is frequently brushed under the carpet is sexual, sex, sexual assault mm -hmm. because it's prominent and it happens almost every home. Uh, but what I thought was most important was the question that was raised was not what is the problem today, but what started this. So I want to say thank you for that because we need to look at where did the problem originally start and not what is the problem today. So can you elaborate on that? Uh, you know, the, the other film we're doing, Resilience, we look at a, a kindergarten school in New Haven, Connecticut, that uh, deals with the fact that their kindergartners are coming in. Some of them have arrived not even knowing their own name and uh, have been subjected to all kinds of things. The idea being that very often, because they're kids, they don't exhibit that problematic behavior yet. They're not, the, the alarm bells aren't going off. Um, but if you get in there and, and deal with it before you're relying on the symptoms to get your attention, you can actually prevent the things that then show up in the teenage years. Why are we waiting? That, that window from 6 to 12, and one of the shocking things for me, it actually took me a while to get used to it, is they have a whole, they've created a character like an Easter bunny or Christmas, a mythical character that the kids write letters to to help them get their feelings out. And this mythical person has a list of things that the kids have to understand. These, this is an okay. And they recite this list in the classroom in the morning. 
and it's not okay to do this to people, it's not okay for people to do this to you, and one of them is, it's not okay for, if it, for anyone to touch you in your private parts. You know, kindergarten. And I was, I went back, I was like, whoa. Uh, I don't know if, if I can deal with this. I don't, you know, and it, I, I had to come up against my own anxiety and discomfort with the idea that that was in the classroom. And then, the, but the principal, who's this very sort of sturdy lady that had been at it forever, she says, hey, look, you know, I mean, we see from their drawings, I know they're coming in here with these experiences. I know it. So why are we pretending that that's not true? I wish it wasn't true, but it is true. So I think, you know, this, what you're talking about, it's just so huge, you know, and important. Well, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining us tonight um, for a very important evening. We're so glad you're here. Please join me in thanking our panelists and thanking Jamie for the wonderful film.